Hello there and welcome to this video for the A-Level Civil Rights in the USA course. In this video what we're going to think about is the trade union and labour rights movement, particularly in the 1970s. In order to understand the 1970s, we just need to place it in the context of what has been the experience of workers in America beforehand. The first point to make if we go back a significant time, is that after World War II, just like World War I, gains have been made by American workers. However, after World War II, we see employers seeking to regain their control by limiting or reversing the gains made in the post-war periods. It was a marriage of convenience for workers to make gains so that industrial production remained high so that the war effort could be maintained. As a result of this, employers seeking to regain control, we see industrial unrest increase after both World War I and World War II. In 1919, over 4 million workers are involved in industrial action and in 1946, it's four and a half million workers being involved. What makes World War II slightly different though is because it's not just employers seeking to regain control. In political circles, union power was also seen as dangerous. By now, post World War II, America has been drawn into the Cold War with the Soviet Union and the Communist Party of America was closely linked to the union movement and therefore unions were treated very suspiciously at this time. Added to that, in the 1946 midterm elections, the Republican Party win a majority in Congress. And therefore, we see a restraining of union activity after World War II. This is furthered throughout the 1950s and into the 1960s. Partly that's because during this time, America experiences an economic boom. And that sees the number of blue collar workers decreasing. And newly created jobs were increasingly concentrated in the white collar and service sectors. At the same time, due to the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, people working for federal, state or local governments often had to sign no-strike agreements. And then lastly, women, an increasing part of the workforce, were also less inclined to join unions. These three, thing, three things combined, white-collar workers increasing, federal, state and local government workers signing no strike agreements and women being part of a workforce increasingly meant that union membership declined from 1953 to 1960, from 36% to 31%. As we said, it's also a time of economic boom and so we see higher wages, average working weeks less than 40 hours and in-work benefits meaning there's a complacency to the union movement post-World War II. That said, there's still great poverty in America by the time of the 1960s. As many as 35 million workers lived below the poverty line and one third of these lived in rural areas. This therefore saw poor rural Americans flooding to the inner cities intensifying urban problems. Part of the problems was seen in the housing and facilities that were available. In the area of New York known as Harlem, half of the housing predated 1900 and there could be up to 12 people sharing apartments with broken windows, poor plumbing or just gaping holes. And therefore we see illiteracy, disease, crime and drug, drug use all high in these areas. On their election in 1960, therefore, the new president, President Kennedy, and his vice president, Lyndon B. Johnson, promised to tackle this, is this issue. The 
Therefore, we see in the 1960s some gains made again for workers, as this plight of the poor is taken up by our new presidential team. For example, in 1963, we see an Equal Pay Act. This gives men and women equal pay for equal work and is an amendment to the Fair Labour Standards Act of 1938 that reinforced that pay differential. We also see President Johnson start out on his Great Society initiative. This is aimed at benefiting those below or close to the poverty line, which as we saw included up to 35 million people by the 1960s. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act outlawed discrimination based on race, colour, religion, sex or national origin thus starting the process of equalising some of the discrimination faced by ethnic minority workers beforehand. The Economic Opportunity Act of 1964 increased training opportunities. And lastly, the Age Discrimination Act of 1968 protected those over the age of 40. And so to repeat, because of these measures at targeting the poor, the 1960s saw some gains made for workers. This is perhaps best exemplified if we look at this table showing union membership, which as you can see, by the time of 1965, has increased to 17.2 million. A final reason for this is also because there is a merger of the American Federation of Labour and the Congress of Industrial Organisations in 1955. This brought together the two largest umbrella unions in the United States to form the AFL-CIO, which still exists to this day. How did this merger come about? Well, for a start, because of the anti-communist initiatives after World War II, communist dominated unions from the CIO were removed and this removed a major obstacle to unification. At the same time, the new presidents of both federations in the early 1950s paved the way for a more receptive view of unity. And so when they did merge, this brought together 85% of union members, a total of 16 million, and therefore through strength in numbers, this increased the potential to bargain over wages, conditions, contracts, holiday pay, pensions, and medical insurance, amongst other things. This was significant for workers because we know that the pay of union members was often 20% higher than non-unionised workers. At the same time, the AFL-CIO also encouraged unions to abandon racist practices, even if that meant losing some of their affiliated unions in the southern states. That said, African Americans were poorly represented on the leadership of the AFL-CIO. And it's also true to say that smaller affiliated unions did not always follow this policy. And we also must say as well that the, the demand for more skilled and technically advanced workers did disadvantage many African Americans at this time, who often lacked the necessary education due to poverty and poor quality schooling. Our key point therefore is this, unions consolidated their position in the 1960s, the right to join a union was now firmly established, and collaboration rather than confrontation was far more common. This brings us to the 1970s. I'd like you to look at two tables. Here's the first and here's the second. What I'd like you to do is quickly make some snap observations from these two sets of data. That won't take you too long. And then I'd like you to go a bit further 
And I'd like you to think about, well, what could explain the trends that these tables show? And you might want to, as a hint, think about what has affected union membership in the past. Pause the video now and consider those two tasks. By now, you've probably paused the video and had a think about some snap observations and something about the explanation for these trends. You would have noticed that during the 1970s up until the end of our course in 1992, the number of strikes is down significantly and the number of workers taking strike action follows suit. So in 1970, there were 381 strikes involving almost two and a half million workers. Yet by 1992, that was down to 35 strikes and only 362,000 workers. And so something must explain this. What has happened in the 1970s and 80s to see such a dramatic reduction? You can see again in the bottom table that the number of union members decreases significantly. As an overall number, it's down by two and a half million, but as a percentage of the workforce, it's down by over 11%. These are significant numbers, and that leads us into thinking about, well, what factors are affecting the labor movement in the 1970s? What can start to explain why we see a reduction in the number of strikes, the number of workers taking strike action, the number of union members and the percentage of the workforce that is unionized. To do this, you will see that there are 20 pieces of evidence now on the screen labeled from A through to S. If you ask your teacher, they can give you a copy of this worksheet if you'd like a physical copy of it. There are four factors that explain why the union movement starts to reduce in terms of its pace, membership, ability to negotiate in the 1970s. The first reason is the changing economy and organisation of American industry. The second is the changing composition of the workforce. The third is the shift in the balance of power between employers and labour unions. And the fourth is the changing political attitudes and policies. What would be good to do at this point is for you to pause the video, read these 20 pieces of evidence and start to categorise them into these four factors. You can see there's a possibility to do a key if you have a physical copy at the bottom of the page. So pause the video read the evidence and start to categorize it into our four categories. By now you would have done the task and your sheet might look something like this. As you can see, I've color coded the various evidence into our four factors. So for example, when we talk about the changing economy and organization of American industry, we can see in evidence O, for example, that unionization was further adversely affected by the increasing trend for some larger industrial concerns to establish subsidiaries in developing countries. This meant that it was tricky for workers to unionize as work was outsourced to other countries where wages were cheaper. Or, for instance, evidence C, where you can see the further expansion of high tech industry had shrunk the workforce and reduced the demand for unskilled labor. You can see there some other categories that have been highlighted. If you need to, feel free to take a moment to pause the video and have a read of these pieces of evidence again, the categories they come under in an attempt to understand what's affecting labor unions in the 1970s. Feel free to pause the video now.
what we now need to do is think about applying this information and what we're going to do is apply it to this particular question this is a thematic question that you would see in section b of your civil rights exam paper as you can see the first part is a statement and then you are asked to say how far you agree with it it reads like this the decline of the union movement in the period 1970 to 1992 was primarily due to the actions and attitudes of the federal government. How far do you agree? What I'd like you to do is write a conclusion to this question. To do this well, you need to do the following things. Firstly, give a clear answer to the question. And that means you're either affirming the statement or giving an alternative answer. So was it the actions and attitudes of the federal government or was another factor primarily affecting the union movement's decline? Be really explicit here. Be really clear about what your answer is. Then you need to give clear reasoning for the answer. This might be repeating some of the key evidence but it also might be thinking about the impact or significance of that evidence. What is convincing you that your answer is correct? As ever, with anything in history, there are a multitude of causes for something happening. So you need to acknowledge the counter arguments. What else is going on here apart from your answer that results in a decline in the union movement? But then you need to finish by giving your winning point. What we mean by that is what is ultimately convincing you that the answer you gave is correct. It's here that you're hammering home to whoever is reading your answer. This is why I ultimately made my decision. Pause the video at this point and spend a good 15 to 20 minutes trying to write this conclusion. The final thing we just need to mention about the union movement in the 1970s is a case study. That's on this man, Cesar Chavez. You should be aware that although there were some gains made in the 60s, farm workers were one group who had not gained from the benefits of organised labour frequently throughout US history. In the 1960s, therefore, there are increasing attempts to remedy this. And the main way that this is seen is by 1966, the merger of two agricultural unions. The first one is the Agricultural Workers Organising Committee, the AWOC. And the second is the National Farm Workers Association, the NFWA. By 1972, they become known as the United Farm Workers or UFW Union. Cesar Chavez becomes the leader of the UFW. He believes in nonviolence, which increasingly makes the plight of agricultural workers a moral cause, which leads to a greatening of national sympathy towards their plight. He achieves three main things at this time. Firstly, he forces growers to recognize the UFW as the bargaining organization in both Florida and California, two significant and populous states. Through his organized strikes in the 1970s, we see a rise in wages for those who work in the lettuce and grape growing industry. This includes the largest farm worker strike in US history, known as the salad bowl strike. And lastly, in 1975, the California Agricultural Relations Act establishes the California Agricultural Relations Board to oversee collective bargaining. However, it must be said that Cesar Chavez also does clash with other union members in the 1970s. He's also criticized because he abandons union activity to become involved in the construction business which often employs non-unionized workers. 
That said, he plays a significant role in the history of the labour movement, not so much because of his practical achievements, but because the labour movement was keen to attract Hispanic members and therefore promoted his Hispanic heritage.